welcome everybody. Uh, sorry I'm a little bit late, but uh, just grateful that you're here. Uh, hopefully today you're going to learn some amazing things that are going to help you and those that you care most about. That's actually why Caring Medical spends so much effort, personnel, time, money to make these webinars. Today I'm going to talk about how vagus nerve degeneration is involved in almost all human disease and what you can do to correct it. If you research autism, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, balance problems, speech difficulties, swallowing difficulties, leaky gut, and you, and you type in those conditions and along with it the vagus nerve, all these articles will pop up. Recently I wrote a, a book on the vagus nerve which is currently getting edited and in the book there's 1400 references. So in other words I looked at 1400 different references on all the different conditions that have vagus nerve neuropathy which I call vagopathy uh, involved in the condition and there wasn't one article that insinuated that the vagus nerve was getting injured by problems in the neck specifically cervical instability so the cause of most people's vagopathies it is actually a problem in the neck so that's kind of where we're heading but today's talk I really wanted to expand everybody's information and knowledge on how exactly the vagus nerve gets injured and why it causes your digestive problems, balance problems, POTS, immune system problems. Okay, so how do I... Okay, we'll go to the next one. So let's look at this. So how can you know specifically that you have a vagus nerve problem? Well, one, when you have vagus nerve problems, your pupils dilate more than average. So that's what gives light sensitivity. If you've noticed a change in your voice quality, you now, you're a woman and you're sounding more like a man, or you got a scratchy throat, or you chronically cough. Uh, you can't sing anymore, you have a vagus nerve problem. If you, you've done everything for upset stomach, nausea, bloating, you, you have diarrhea, then you have constipation, and especially if you have constipation, you have a chronic uh, vagus nerve problem. You have a vagopathy, which most vagopathy is from the cervical, cervical or neck problem, so we call the disease cervical vagopathy. If you look and go, ah, and you look at the thing hanging down the back of your throat, and if that uh, tissue, which is called the uvula, deviates to one side, you have a vagus nerve problem. If your ear is red, or you have a sensitivity to touch in your ear canal, uh, in the temperature, is different on a certain part of your ear, you have a vagus nerve problem. If doctors, you've gone to a million doctors and nobody can figure out what's the cause of your problem, you probably have cervical instability, which is causing a vagus nerve problem and that's what's causing your symptom. Just read, you know, when you lay down, when you lay down and you feel much better, while well, laying down takes pressure off of the neck, takes pressure off of the, your vagus nerves and you feel better. Uh, if you have a low heart rate variability, so this is the monitor I use uh, to monitor my heart rate variability. Heart rate variability is the best test currently for functioning of the vagus nerve and we'll talk more about that later. If you have sensitivity to light or sound, like you, bright lights irritate your eyes and loud sounds irritate your ears, you most likely have a vagus nerve problem. If you're having difficulty swallowing or you choke on your food or you swallow and the food goes up into your nose or you cough after um, you swallow, that's a vagus nerve problem. If you've got, undergone traditional testing and they can't find the cause of your 
symptoms, most likely you have a vagus nerve problem, and we are going to talk about why traditional testing doesn't uh, doesn't find the problem. So let's look at this. Um, I'm, so I'm going to look a little bit away because I can see it better on this other screen. So if you have headache, pain, facial pain, bloodshot eyes, blurry vision, uh, pain behind the eyes, sunlight affects you, your bites off, you, you can't uh, really hear too good, you've got itchy ears, your ears feel clogged, you have a lot of secretions in your throat, chronic sore throats, chronic neck pain, stiffness, any of these symptoms, most likely you have cervical instability causing a vagus nerve problem, and uh, there's lots of ways that will show you how to help this. Next. That's me, that's our digital motion x-ray. So my name's Dr. Ross Hauser. I've been doing prolotherapy uh, for cervical instability for 27 years. I'm coming to you live from our Florida office. Um, next. We see some of the most uh, complicated cases around the world. Just in the last two or three weeks, I've consulted on patients who have needed uh, They've needed uh, blood patches in their spinal canal to get rid of some of their symptoms. Other patients have had to have their cerebral spinal fluid taken out. We see people with cerebellar tonsillar ectopia, uh, you know, horrible balance problems, wheelchair bound. Recent, today I saw a patient who has a central line and she gets IV fluids just to keep her blood pressure up and she walked into the office for the, f she, she basically can now walk where she was, she was wheelchair bound and she's only had two or three prolotherapy visits. I, Marianne and I, my wife and I have written uh, nine books on uh, prolother prolotherapy and published many different scientific uh, papers. They're available at caringmedical.com and prolotherapy.org. Uh, so I encourage you to go to those sites. We do write a newsletter which keeps people up to date on various types of instability and how it causes a lot of problems, including cervical instability causing vagus nerve problems. So I encourage everybody to get that newsletter. We do have a Facebook page, Friends of Caring Medical. That's a great place just to talk to other patients who've seen me, seen the other providers at Caring Medical. We have an office here and then we have one in uh, Oak Park. I would like to thank my media team, which includes Barry Weiner, my, my publicist. Izzy's here with Ben, who've done a lot of work with Nicole and Travis on this webinar. So I'd just like to personally thank them and Marion, our CEO over the company. Uh, I'm coming to you live from the Hauser Next Center. We're in Fort Myers, Florida. Uh, I do do Skype visits, meaning that if somebody lives far away, like, and they're wondering if they're a prolotherapy candidate, so we do do, I do do some telemedicine or Skype visits. The reason why we started doing that was some of the cases are so severe, the instability is so severe, and the vagus nerve problems are so severe that it actually is beneficial for the person to live here and get treated. Uh, for, for a couple months uh, while they're here and they can get treated more frequently. Uh, I want to first explain why when people go to, like we recently had a case where they went to two of the most prominent medical centers, and I won't mention their <laughs> names, but one of them's in Minnesota and the other one's in Ohio. But uh, the uh, why they don't uh, figure out what the problem is. See, traditional medicine testing always has a person laying down. Like, they, they'll, they'll be laying down for an MRI. And even when they do blood vessel tests, the person's laying down. Where in our office, we do dynamic or upright testing. So when, we, when, when we're doing uh, testing for cervical instability, we actually have the person uh, move their neck around while they're getting a digital motion x-ray. Then when we do our blood vessel testing to see if, where's the, did somebody bring in a model? Okay. 
so uh, it, so so uh, in the in the cervical spine are the vertebral arteries. So we do blood vessel tests when a person's upright, and we're actually going to show you. I think it's the next thing we're going to show. Can we? Okay. Okay. So yes, I'm going to show you live video or video of a vascular test in our office showing that the blood flow stops. Basically, the severity of a person's vagopathy will determine how bad the symptoms are. So if somebody's vagus nerve is really degenerated, and we can tell this because the size of the vagus nerve gets smaller and smaller, and when the vagus nerve size goes down, it means that the neurons within the vagus nerve are actually dying. And the cause of the dying is one of two things. It's either stretch and compression from the neck, which we call, I call cervical destructure, or it's the major stresses that are going on in a person's life. Those are the main two things that cause the vagus nerve neurons to degenerate. The severity of the instability and the vagus nerve degeneration determines basically how many prolotherapy visits that a person needs. For those who aren't familiar with the term prolotherapy, prolotherapy is a treatment that stimulates the body to repair painful areas. Prolotherapy injections are done into the ligaments that connect the bones in the spine and that stabilizes the spine. Stability of the spine means that as a person moves, the vertebrae stay together. Instability means the vertebrae move excessively and when they move excessively, that's what compresses or stretches the arteries, the veins, the brain stem, uh, the ligaments. Uh, the spinal cord, and that's what gives a lot, a lot of the symptoms that people have. Okay. Now we're going to watch some vascular testing. I think you'll, you guys will find it fascinating. Note that the blood supply is going to actually stop by very small movements of the neck. <clears throat> It's totally objective, right? Art. It's totally objective. You have vertebral artery. See? Yeah. Okay, let's do it again. Is are you getting the waves too? Yeah. Okay, go for it. Yeah, that's it. That's that's for Karina, here we're seeing on the screen here uh, your left middle cerebral artery, the blood flow, the peak systolic blood flow is around 95 to 100 centimeters per second, and the same thing on the right. Uh, and then your heart rate variability right now is in the 40s. And what we're going to have you do is bend and uh, flex your neck and then twist to the left. So if you could do that. Okay, we see a complete cutoff of the blood supply. So we'll have you, we'll have you come back, have you come back, have you come back. To the right. seeing her have a mild dystonic storm. She's having a mild dystonic storm. And then the blood supply is coming back. It's coming back and notice that she turns her head to the right. Doing great. Do you feel up to doing the next motion? Okay. Okay. So uh, we see the peak systolic blood flows, you know, 93, 90. So now all we're going to have you do is uh, look up. So we'll have you look up. So you're looking up, and we're seeing it's going down to zero again. It's going down to zero. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And we see another dystonic storm, another dystonic storm. Very 
quickly, the blood's flow gets back. We back? Yep. Okay, so you go to the next one. The, here, I just want to comment a little bit about the video that you just saw. Obviously, it's very, very dramatic. So the more serious a person's symptoms, and let's agree Karina's symptoms, the young lady there, like she's in a wheelchair, uh, her symptoms are severe. She, she suffers with dystonic storms. So some of the dystonic episodes can last for, you know, greater than five minutes. If you go on YouTube or our website, you'll see one, you'll see another one with Jamie where Jamie's dystonia is even more severe. The cause of their dystonia is obstruction of blood flow from the changes in their cervical spine. So if I take the model of the cervical spine, right, the cervical spine is supposed to be like this. Yeah, like this. And then their cervical spines, because of the ligament laxity, has changed. And then when they do certain movements, when they do certain movements, because of their ligament laxity, ligament injury in their neck, it obstructs uh, the flow of blood to their brain. So the testing that they need is dynamic uh, transcranial Doppler. That's what we did with both of them. And anybody with severe symptoms, severe neurologic symptoms that nobody can figure out should get transcranial Doppler in our office. And uh, what we do is we put the, 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 the ultrasound probes and measure the blood flow in the middle cerebral artery, the posterior cerebral artery, and then we figure out where in the neck the problem's coming from. And you saw with Christina, it wasn't just one movement of her neck, it was several movements. Once we have that information, we know where, how to brace the person so the blood flow is always normal. And then when the neck becomes stable and the curve gets corrected, the blood flow improves. So then eventually they can do those movements without having a dystonic episode. Uh, so for those of you who don't know what H3 prolotherapy is, so Dr. Hackett invented the term prolotherapy, taught Dr. Hemwall the, treat, the treatment in 1955. I joined Dr. Hemwall when he was 85 years old in 1993. Yeah, and then he died at the age of 90 in 1998. So that's me and Dr. Hemwall. Pro, <coughs> prolotherapy treatments are normally given once every four to six weeks, though like I said, for severe upper cervical instability cases, I might treat somebody every couple weeks. Uh, but Hemwall Hackett Hauser Prolotherapy can be done in many, many body parts. Uh, for really severe cases, we actually have a nurse anesthetist come in and then we, we do pretty much the whole person's, uh, all the joints of the body because some really severe Ehlers-Danlos cases come here. Ehlers-Danlos syndrome is a disorder where basically all the joints of the body are loose and that, and, and that condition is a progressive ligament condition and the treatment for that, in my opinion, the treatment of choice for that is prolotherapy. Prolotherapy will strengthen and tighten the ligaments and resolve the instability. And then we're just going to show you a quick video on what prolotherapy is like for those who are unfamiliar with it. And uh, this is actually a person who came to me because she had a, a stroke and nobody could figure out the cause. So we figured out the cause of it was she had a plaque in her internal carotid artery. When, and then when she turned a certain way, the, she had a complete occlusion of the blood vessel. And uh, her, the cervical instability was uh, uh, contributing to that. And when we do the upper cervical spine, we uh, do it under x-ray guidance or ultrasound guidance. And you can see me seeing exactly uh, where the needle is and then placing the prolotherapy solution in the ligaments, the capsular ligaments at C1, C2. We do the whole, pretty much the whole posterior ligament complex. 
Um, and once those ligaments get tight, the person doesn't have excessive joint movement and thus the tension on the vagus nerve, on the spinal cord, on the brain stem, it goes down and so do their symptoms. As you can see, there's one vagus nerve on the right, one vagus nerve on the left. The vagus nerve on the right, that primarily innervates the heart. So when that, the vagus nerve on the right is stimulated, you get slowing of the heart rate and you get lowering of blood pressure. Then the vagus nerve on the left goes to the intestines. So anybody with digestive disorders, and we'll talk about this in more detail, they often have a left vagus nerve issue where the left vagus nerve is degenerated. In this, you can see that the vagus nerve runs right in front of C1. See that C1 on this side, then C1 on that side. It's also important to realize the cell body where the genetic code of the vagus nerve is the cell body, which is the brains of the vagus nerve, is sits right in front of C1, and that ganglion is called the no-dose ganglion. So you'll hear that term a lot. No-dose ganglion is the cell bodies of the vagus nerve. So that's the brains of the vagus nerve. Where the vagus nerve primarily is getting injured is in the lat by the lateral masses here of the atlas. And if you have tilting, if you have a subluxation, if you have instability involving the atlas, it could totally screw up your, uh, your, your, your uh, vagus nerves. So anybody with a vagus nerve problem has to get an assessment of the atlas. So that involves either getting a digital motion x-ray, that's what I would recommend, or you have to see an upper cervical chiropractor and many of them are excellent. Most of them understand prolotherapy and are very good at referring to a prolotherapist if the adjustments they do don't hold. Okay. This slide is great. The vagus nerve is composed of 100,000 neurons. Now compare that to the brain. The brain has 1 billion neurons. The eye, the optic nerve has one million neurons, and the enteric nervous system has a has a hundred million. So the vagus nerves only have a uh, hundred thousand neurons compared to a hundred million in the digestive tract. So that means that if that one uh, vagus neuron will affect thousands and thousands of other neurons. The vagus nerve is the body's patrol to make sure everything is safe in the body, that the nutrition is good in the body, that blood pressure is fine, the pulse rate is low, the body feels safe. So anybody who constantly feels stressed or there's a change in plans and they go ballistic or they can't control their emotions you know, you have a vagus nerve problem. So for the body to function properly, the vagus nerve has to be telling the brain the correct information. Like the, 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 liver's, the liver's functioning good, the spleen is fine, the hormones are well. If the vagus nerve is, isn't functioning well, the brain gets crazy information. Like, you know what, I, so somebody who has POTS, postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, the brain isn't, isn't controlling uh, the blood pressure and the pulse correctly. Why is it not doing it? Because it's getting crazy information from the vagus nerve. So the vagus, the vagus nerve could be telling the brain the pulse is high when it's low or it's low when it's high. You know, and so the brain doesn't give the right input to the vagus nerve to then speed up heart, to, to, to slow down heart rate or the sympathetic system to speed up heart rate. Uh, if the vagus nerve is not able to assist enough because its own health is compromised, you basically get a disease. 
meaning that the if if the vagus nerve can't assess the situation right, it can't then cause, for instance, the blood flow to the organ to improve. So, so then the organ can't do what it needs to do to repair itself, so then you get a disease. And this is just kind of an overview. If you, again, if you research dementia, cancer, hypothyroid, heart ischemia, nausea, colitis, uh, you'll see that um, all those things are associated with poor vagus nerve function. Poor vagus nerve function is found often by testing the vagus nerve through heart rate variability. So when the heart rate variability is low, that's a sign that the vagus nerve functioning is low and the sympathetic system is high. Uh, when you take a deep breath, let me just talk about this just for a second because there's going to be people who want to see if their vagus nerve is functioning good. So when you take a deep breath, the heart rate speeds up a little bit so more oxygen gets into the blood. And then when you breathe out, the heart rate speeds up. So when you're relaxed, so for instance, if we check my heart rate variability right now, we would be able to tell whether I'm relaxed or I'm stressed. So hopefully if we tested it, my heart rate variability would be high. The higher your heart rate variability is, the stronger your vagal tone, the more you can handle stress. Whether it's relationship stress, toxic food, you know, chemicals in the food, electromagnetic radiation, uh, from cell towers, you know, 5G, uh, work stress, or even stress from a healthcare condition. So that's why the vagus nerve is involved in every single human disease. And when the vagus nerve function is poor, you're going to get uh, systemic inflammation. You're going to get systemic inflammation and your ability to detoxify toxins in your body goes way, way down. Okay, so this is kind of cool. The vagus nerve is the defender and the protector of the body against all stressors, pollutants, infections, current stressors, chemicals, toxins. So if you've been to a holistic provider and they said you have leaky gut and you get on a diet or you take glutamine or you take a million different supplements, and it doesn't resolve, well, you, you have a vagus nerve problem. The, you have to have a strong vagus nerve to have the tight junctions between the gastrointestinal cells to repair themselves. So in other words, to resolve the leaky gut, you have to have good vagal tone. Uh, if the holistic provider said you, you, you're toxic and, you, and you're not detoxifying well, well, it means your liver isn't functioning well. What's the nerve input to the liver so your liver functions good? Well, it's the vagus nerve. You got gastroparesis, your stomach isn't working right. Well, what's the, what's the nerve input to have the stomach contract and have uh, hydrochloric acid be secreted? That's the vagus nerve. You, so, if, so if you have a stressor and your body doesn't stay calm, like it drives you crazy, like loud noises, light sensitivity, you can't eat certain foods, you're allergic to a million foods, what cause, why are you allergic to a million foods? Other people can eat a million foods. You've got a vagus nerve problem, so if you want to resolve all your food sensitivities, all your chemical sensitivities, all your hyper reaction to stress, you have got to improve your vagal tone. So the main way to improve the vagal tone is get the stretch and tension off of the vagal tone by correcting your cervical curve and correcting the instability. Next. Okay, poor vagal tone. Somebody who has chronic Lyme disease, fibromyalgia, multiple chemical sensitivities, central sensitization syndrome, all those things are primarily caused by or associated with poor vagal tone. 
So if you've been diagnosed with chronic Lyme disease, fibromyalgia, central pain sensitization syndrome, multiple chemical sensitivities, and you're seeing everybody, you're seeing a really good holistic provider, but you're actually not resolving the condition, it's because you have poor vagal tone. The difference between somebody who can eat every food and nothing causes them a problem, and the person who has to eat these 10 foods, otherwise they feel sick, it's vagal tone. The higher your vagal tone, the more you can handle any kind of a stressor, whether it's food stress, chemical stress, relationship stress. So that's why vagal tone and vagal health is so important to keep the body healthy and, and uh, to resolve symptoms like brain fog, anxiety, depression, obsessive compulsive disorder, uh, mental fatigue, you know, beside balance issues, migraine headaches, tension headaches. Fibromyalgia, you have body pain. So why do you have body pain? You know, why do you have body pain? What's causing your body pain? You've been diagnosed with small fiber neuropathy. What's causing it is low vagal tone. It's low vagal tone. The body can't heal without the vagus nerve. Like the vagus nerve is what has the body heal, what cleans up inflammation. When you have a workout or you did something where you inflamed your muscles, it's the vagus nerve that helps the body repair all that damage. You can't sleep. Well, what's, if you have high vagal tone, you go right to sleep. If you have low vagal tone, you're all stressed out and you can't sleep. So again, even sleeplessness related to vagal tone. Okay, next. Look at, look at this thing. Look at this thing. Wow. So, in other words, when it says central sensitization syndrome, it means that your nervous system is on alert. Your sympathetic system is so high, and your parasympathetic, which is the healing, the peaceful, the joy system, is very low. All these things, pa panic disorder, pelvic disorder, multiple chemical sensitivity, Meniere disease, irritable bowel, brain fog, uh, here, since they mentioned Chiari, if you have a Chiari or you've been diagnosed with cerebellar tonsil ectopia, please do not sign up for surgery. So any good upper cervical chiropractor, any good prolotherapy person has helped a person with cerebellar tonsil or ectopia of one centimeter or 10 centimeters or less resolve their symptoms without surgery. Chronic pelvic pain, edema or swelling and nobody can figure out why. You have chronic fatigue syndrome. You have fatigue and nobody can figure it out. Uh, you have a vagus nerve problem. So all these things, if you research them, polycystic ovarian syndrome, sick building syndrome, vulvodynia, tinnitus, hyperventilation, hormone imbalance, you'll see that they're all associated with low vagal tone, low heart rate variability, poor parasympathetic activity, and if you get a digital motion x-ray or you measure your vagus nerves, you're going to, on ultrasound, you'll see that you have vagus nerve degeneration, you do have cervical destructure or abnormalities in your cervical spine, and once those things get corrected, once you resolve the cervical instability with prolotherapy, you have your curve corrected, the symptoms go away. So the, here's the systemic effects when you have vagus nerve degeneration. You'll get Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, depression, increased heart rate, blurry vision, uh, hyperarousal of the sensory system, meaning somebody touches your your forearm and you jump, right? That's what fibromyalgia is, you have all these tender spots. You have low hormones, diabetes insipidus, nobody can figure out why. Mast cell activation syndrome, bloating, nausea, poor temperature regulation, right? One day you're hot, next day you're cold. This area is hot, this area is cold. That's vagus nerve problem. You have OCD, you have hoarseness, choking, difficulty breathing. If as this talk goes on, as I enter into the 90 minute to 120 minutes, you might see me, I get more and more hoarse or more and more secretions. Well, that means 
my vagal tone is good enough so my vocal cords are have enough nervous input through the vagus nerve for 90 minutes but but beyond 90 minutes there's a struggle right so that's that that's a sign of you know i don't have the vagal tone of say a tony robbins who can scream and shout for hours and hours next so here, body homeostasis, the vagus nerve connects the central nervous system, immune systems, endocrine systems. So if your endocrine system is shot, right, you go to holistic providers, endocrinologists, and it's one, you got hypocortisolism, you've been diagnosed with Addison's disease, low cortisol, you have to take melatonin, right, because your melatonin level's low, you're hypothyroid, all those things, can be from a vagus nerve problem. You've had various infections. You have small bowel uh, bacterial overgrowth, SIBO, you have SIBO. You, you, a holistic provider said you had candidiasis, yeast overgrowth. Uh, you have uh, in bacterial dysbiosis. All these terms mean that your immune system is low the immune system is probably low because your vagal tone's low. Well, why is your vagal tone low? Because you're under too much stress? Well, if you're under too much stress because you have job stress, well, is there anything you can do to resolve the job stress? If you have anxiety and you don't know why, you probably have structural anxiety from your neck. And the treatment for that is prolotherapy and getting your cervical curve good. Okay, so this is what, uh, the, the, so in other words, the normal cervical curve here, the normal cervical curve is supposed to be a C. See this person, they have a reversal of their curve, and this is, see where the pointer is? That's at the anterior part of C1, and see how the vagus nerve has to do this 90 degree turn right here, right? So as you move your head, you can imagine when you have a C, see how there's a direct route of the vagus nerve into the brain. So in other words, the, vagus, the neck's supposed to go this way. When you have a reversal of the curve, the vagus nerve has to make this 90 degree turn. And it's at this 90 degree turn that the pressure is so great that the no-dose ganglion just gets annihilated. So one, and again, once the vagus neurons start dying, right, your vagus function is going to go down and it's going to go down and then all of a sudden you're going to get ringing in the ears and you get headaches and you can't handle stress as good. You start <clears throat> getting hoarse, you get ringing in the ears, you feel dizzy, you got a uh, maldebarkment syndrome where you feel like you're all C you've got like seasickness and wobbliness, or you have stutter vision, where you look at things, then you look away and you still see the image, or you have blurry vision and nobody can figure out the cause. You have new onset macular degeneration or glaucoma and the doctors can't figure out why you have it and you're so young. Uh, you know, you have brain fog, uh, you've been diagnosed with depression or anxiety and you don't even know why and the doctor wants to give you an antidepressant and you have a nice life, you have a good family. You know, all these things can have at their root cause cervical destructure causing cervical vagopathy and I just call that Hauser's disease, meaning that it's the cervical instability causing the vag vagopathy and the degeneration of the vagus nerve and ultimately all these healthcare conditions. Next. Thank you for Izzy for helping me here. So here, like this is the vertebral artery. So you could see where if you have looseness of any of these vertebrae, it can cut off uh, blood supply to the vertebral artery. If you have, if you can get a symptom like dizziness and all you have to do is turn your head a little way you have got to get transcranial Doppler uh, test. You have to get a dynamic uh, test for the blood supply to the brain. This is the brain stem. Uh, so you could see when somebody has a normal lordotic cervical curve, the vertebrae get closer together. 
when you're hunched over, right? So here's my cell phone. Notice that the cover is yellow, right? Because yellow is a peaceful color, a happy color. So all of you should try to incorporate yellow into your life. So when you're hunched over, when you're hunched over, the vertebrae, they separate, right? The vertebrae separates. So that elongates the spinal cord. It pulls tension onto the brain stem and can cause cerebellar tonsillar ectopia. And in the brain stem is your nausea center. So any tension on the brain stem from kyphosis, so this is a kyphotic spine, it means it's bent over, then that can cause nausea. That can irritate the respiratory center of the brain stem. So you might have a shortness of breath or you have trouble breathing and nobody can figure out the cause. Well, the cause could be cervical instability causing a vagus nerve issue and also one that pulls on the brain stem and that can give you shortness of breath. Also, when vagus nerve input to the vocal cords uh, is not there, the vocal cords don't open and close correctly. So imagine if your vocal cords couldn't open properly, then of course you can't get airway, you can't get air into your lungs, you're gonna feel short of breath. Okay, next. Wow, look at this. Cervical instability can cause drop attacks. So drop attacks definitely get an assessment for uh, cervical instability by digital motion x-ray. And of course, cervical instability can cause vagus nerve compression. It also causes post-concussion syndrome, vertebral basal or ischemia. Uh, if you feel like your head's in a vise and there's pressure there all the time, you probably have increased intracranial pressure. Increased intracranial pressure can give you blurry vision along with a constant headache, constant headache. Vertigo, the most common cause of chronic vertigo, spinning feeling, dizzy feeling, ringing in the ears, migraine headaches is uh, cervical instability, either because it cuts off blood supply or it causes vagus neuropathy or vagopathy. So these are the mechanisms by which cervical instability causes symptoms. Subluxation, if you have chronic muscle tension, whenever you have a ligament injured, when you have a ligament injured, the body will uh, contract a muscle to limit the bony motion because right, remember we said that the vagus nerve sits right in front of C1. So if the muscles back here didn't tighten, it means that every time you turn your head, you'd smash into the, the vagus nerve. So muscle tension, like in your neck, is protecting your vagus nerve as well as your uh, superior cervical sympathetic ganglion from getting further injury. So that chronic muscle tightness you have way up high, that's a sign that you have ligament injury in your neck and most likely you have cervical vagopathy. The cervical upper cervical limit, ligament damage can cause brain stem ischemia, cerebellar ischemia, uh, uh, compression of the venous system. The internal jugular vein drains the brain. So if you have cervical instability, it can compress the carotid sheath. In the carotid sheath is the internal carotid artery, the vagus nerve, spinal accessory nerve, glossopharyngeal nerve, as well as the carotid artery. So any of those things can get compressed, and if the internal jugular vein gets compressed, your brain cannot drain, so it's like a plugged up toilet. Many of you know you feel like you have a toxic brain, right? You have brain fog, you can't think, you can't focus, you get exhausted just by reading anything, you're having difficulty work, so it's probable that the, the, the internal jugular vein or uh, the cerebral spinal fluid, which is the fluid that the, keeps the brain tissue healthy, if you will, like all the waste products of the brain ultimately have to go in the cerebral spinal fluid, which has to get drained 
uh, through the internal jugular vein. So if the brain toilet is clogged up, it's just like a clogged up toilet, man, it smells. Except the smell is sitting in your cranium and how you get that to drain is you gotta figure out uh, what posture you have the optimum drainage and the optimum blood flow and we can surely help you figure that out by doing the various vascular tests that we do in the office. And obviously here, autonomic nervous system dysregulation. So if you've been diagnosed with dysautonomia or you think you have it, but the traditional autonomic nervous system tests didn't show it, they didn't show it because those tests uh, put too much emphasis on blood pressure to tilt table but uh, the testing we do for autonomic nervous system, we place more emphasis on heart rate variability. And heart rate variability is a more sensitive test for dysautonomy and vagus nerve degeneration than blood pressure. Blood pressure is more of an end stage uh, problem. Okay. Wow, it, this, if you were gonna try to learn one slide, it's really this slide. So when you have vagus neuropathy or decreased vagus cholinergic anti-inflammatory uh, system, you, basically your body loses the ability to regulate inflammation or regulate the immune system. So what that can cause is cancer, autoimmune diseases. You've been diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, uh, mixed connective tissue disease, you have a vagus nerve problem, any kind of immunodeficiency disorder, you know, like I said, chronic Lyme disease, yeast, bacterial overgrowth, uh, that you have a vagus nerve problem. Uh, the vagus nerve stimulus to the internal organs causes the organ to make a secretion. So if you have decreased secretions in the liver, your body's ability to detoxify goes down. And then if your body can't get rid of inflammation in the digestive tract, you're gonna get Crohn's disease, uh, irritable bowel disease, colitis, uh, ulcerative colitis. Uh, when the vagus nerve input to the mucosa of the digestive tract is low, you're gonna get increased intestinal permeability, which causes leaky gut, which can cause body pain, which can cause multiple food sensitivities, can cause malabsorption of nutrients. When your gallbladder doesn't work right and your liver doesn't work right, you can get gallstones, bloating, nausea, poor digestion. If you have to take digestive enzymes to digest your food, well, you got a vagus nerve problem because your vagus nerve input to the pancreas is low, so the pancreas isn't making the enzymes. If you have diabetes and you don't know why, even though you have normal diet or normal weight, you probably have a vagus nerve problem. When the vagus nerve gets degenerated, you get arterial spasms all over the body. The arterial spasms can cut off blood supply to the kidney. You have glomerulonephritis, you have poor kidney function and nobody knows why, like you don't have diabetes. Well, you probably got vagus nerve degeneration causing vasospasm into your renal arteries, causing glomerulonephritis, which can cause end-stage kidney disease. You have blurry vision, you have darkening of vision, you have retinopathy, macular degeneration, nobody knows the cause. You probably have a cervical vagopathy causing vasospasms in, those, in that artery. We can measure the arterial blood supply in our office. You, if you get ischemia into the organ of corti, which has to do with balance. You can have hearing deficits. We've had people that have had hear, they used to need hearing aids. They don't need any more hearing aids after we get done with them and their balance gets better. You have heart disease. Nobody can figure out the cause. Well, you probably got vasospasm or decreased uh, blood supply to the heart from vagopathy. You have symptoms compatible with brainstem degeneration. You have your tongue, your tongue, you know, you, 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 you know, your tongue doesn't work. You probably have cervical vagopathy or you have brainstem degeneration. You have, uh, you know, like you have ataxia. The person said you're pre-Parkinson's or you're Parkinsonian-like. 
Again, you probably have cervical vagopathy. You have psychiatric disorders and you don't know why, or the psychiatrist doesn't know why. You probably have structural anxiety, structural obsessive compulsive disorder, structural brain fog. You have an endocrinopathy, your, your testosterone's low and you don't know why. Uh, you, you're hypothyroid, melatonin. So this, uh, this slide really explains a lot of the pathology of human disease and it all or originates from the vagus nerve. And it's really either there's a, you have such a major stressor in your life and that's causing the vagus nerve degeneration or you have a structural problem that's in your neck and that's actually what's causing the vagus neurons to, uh, to degenerate and causing the vagopathy. Okay, so we'll just show you like, before, this is before and after uh, prolotherapy, a stable, an unstable C1, C2, and a... So this is how we diagnose in the office. We do motion scanning to show uh, where a person's cervical spine is unstable. Any overhang over three millimeters is considered severe. And <clears throat> after... Uh, prolotherapy, the uh, spine is now stable, and that usually correlates, almost all the time correlates with the improvement of the person's symptoms. Okay, we can do the next one. Well, I have Izzy next to me, so we did a scan on Laney. This was Laney at about 13 weeks. And you could see right here, see how a baby, even in a mother's womb, womb has a cervical curve. Then this is Laney, right? And this is... Laney. Oh, that's Laney too. Mm -hmm. Wow. How old's Laney now? Four months. Oh, so she's already raising her head. Oh, yeah. Okay, okay. so, okay, this is Laney at 13 weeks. This is, you know, uh, and then this is her at four months. So, in other words, kids are supposed to be looking up, looking up, looking up. Why... Our, you know, kids, babies look up. Kids are supposed to be looking up at parents. When they're in school, they're supposed to be looking up at the teacher. And honestly, all of us are supposed to be looking up. And that looking up maintains the cervical curve. So Laney's cervical curve, which is right here, her normal lordotic curve, will just keep increasing and increasing as long as her mother and father keep her looking up. And there's one thing, dangerous thing, the most dangerous thing to Laney's neck is what? What's the most dangerous thing? Next. What's the most dangerous thing to Laney's neck? It's the, it's the iPad. So this is, who, this is, Will. okay, this is Will. This is uh, a rare moment where Izzy let Will, her five-year-old, five Look at the iPad. See, look at the look at look at what happens to his neck. So, if you want to protect your children, you have got to get them away from iPads around and away from cell phones. If you are struggling with your health, or you have a loved one struggling with their health, you have got to stop looking down at cell phones. So, in other words, looking down is going to stretch the ligaments. And there comes a point where those ligaments are like rubber bands. They are not going to snap back to their normal length. So if you keep looking down at cell phones, you are going to get cervical instability and you are going to end up in a prolotherapist's office. Not that I wouldn't like injecting you, but I only have so many appointment slots. But no, but in the end, hopefully some of you are going to you know, take this to heart and I'm just telling you, the whole population is getting cervical instability. So what we did in our office, some of the kids of some of my staff, we just x-rayed them. And honestly, they're all losing their curve. And, and, and again, joint instability is a progressive disorder. So if you think about a hinge on a door, your cabinet doors, and if one screw on the hinge gets loose and you open and close the door, what's going to happen to the next screw? That screw gets loose. Once that hinge is loose, what's going to happen to the next hinge? The next hinge gets loose. So if you have cervical instability, even in one level, the condition is a progressive disorder. 
So all of us have to be cognizant of our neck, our necks, and so all of us should have our computer screens really high, right? So we're looking up. So what maintains the cervical curve are the cervical ligaments and the musculature, right? Prolotherapy is there to tighten the ligaments, but a person still has to strengthen their muscles. If you don't, if you don't, if you don't do that and you end up with a curve like this, the vagus nerve right here is going to get stretched and it's going to get compressed. And what's going to happen is your ability to handle stress goes down, goes down, goes down. So if you feel like your ability to handle stress is going down, you're starting to get or you already have a significant vagopathy. So you have got to stop that. Even if you get prolotherapy or curve correction, you have got to stop the reason why your cervical curve is getting assaulted and you're losing your normal or dotted curve, which is looking down. So I hope I've made that point strong enough. And all the conditions that we talk about with adults, kids get them, okay. So that means if you have a child or a child's not developing good, they have developmental delay, they have hypersensitive things, they have migraine headaches, uh, they're, they have poor tone, they have cerebral palsy and they're not progressing, uh, they have balance issues, uh, the, they, have, they have autism and nobody's figured out the cause of it. You, honestly, you got to get a scan. You got to get a scan, and you got to go. Well, I think you should have us evaluate. Have you have us evaluate them? So the face down lifestyle causes cervical ligament injury, which causes anterior displacement of the head in front of the curve, which further accelerates the ligament injury, which eventually causes a vagopathy, which then causes all kinds of terrible diseases liver disease, pancreas disease, kidney disease, uh, inner ear disease, Meniere's disease, fibromyalgia, and the whole gamut of uh, human disease. Okay, you know, and then even just on static x-rays, you could see all these terrible curves, right? The curve's supposed to be like this. You know, you could see ligament damage just in a standard x-ray even though the best so if you if you get a regular x-ray at a chiropractic office and you don't and you have a straight curve just know man you're already well on your way to ligament damage and cervical vagopathy next okay so these are the five major detrimental effects of cervical kyphosis the weight of the curve the weight of the head is in front of the curve so in other words, the weight of the head is supposed to be behind the curve, but when you have this kyphotic curve, the weight of the head's in front of the curve, that's gonna stretch the posterior ligament complex, which of course causes increased force and further damage to the atlantoaxial joint, the C1, C2. So upper cervical instability is the number one cause beside chronic uh, stressors that cause damage to the vagus nerve and of course, this kyphotic curve is going to pull down on the brainstem, so it can affect all the nuclei, all the neurons in the brainstem, and that's the control center for blood pressure, pulse, digestion, respiration. And once that thing starts to tank, your body can't regulate the normal things it needs to be healthy. Okay, so. The, here's the vagus nerve. See how close it is to C1, C2? The vagus nerve has connections to the trigeminal nerve, facial nerve, uh, the blood vessels that go to the brain, uh, the hypoglossal nerve. So if you've been diagnosed with trigeminal neuralgia, TMJ, your tongue, your tongue doesn't work right. Like, in other words, you do, you, your speech is being affected. The muscles of the tongue are the hypoglossal nerves. If taste, you have a metallic taste in your mouth, you have burning mouth syndrome, uh, you know, that, that can be the vagus nerve. Taste is cranial nerve seven, which is the facial nerve. 
It's cranial nerve 9, glossopharyngeal nerve, cranial nerve 10, vagus nerve. Uh, if you have sensitivity to sound, the facial nerve innervates uh, the uh, stapedius muscle. The stapedius muscle, that's what dampens sound. So you have sensitivity to sound. You have uh, something affecting your facial nerve, which can be C1, C2 instability, or C1, C2 issues affecting the vagus nerve, which affects the facial nerve. One point I gotta make is that one of the major effects of the vagus nerve is to control sympathetic output. So the sympathetic system is the flight or fight uh, system. It helps our bodies when we have to fight an invader. So if you have an infection, you actually want your sympathetic system to be strong so it can cause inflammation in the body to fight the infection. Uh, but if, if uh, the sympathetic system uh, is too hyperactive, obviously, and your body is feeling stress, feeling stress, feeling stress all the time, then that means that your vagus tone is not high enough, so you have to get your vagus tone up, which means that you have to correct why the vagus nerve is getting injured. So here's the no-dose ganglion. So you can see the no-dose ganglion here, and that's going to be smashed with C1, C2 instability. And this is where it goes into the medulla oblongata. So if the vagus nerve is getting stressed because of cervical instability and cervical destructure, that's where the cell bodies of the vagus nerve are, and that's where it gets injured. Oh, it's just worth show me because I'll do it. Okay. So any sort of stressors can injure the vagus nerve. So any sort of divorce, emotional conflict, financial difficulty, poor diet. And don't underestimate how you think. Like anybody who has toxic thinking, stressful thinking, like if you feel like you're not beautiful enough or you're not good enough or you're not worthy and you have that thought over and over and over again, it's ultimately going to cause damage to your vagus nerve, in my opinion. The proper thought process is, and the truthful thought process is, I'm beautiful, God loves me, uh, I'm, a, I'm, I'm highly intelligent, I'm awesome. You know, and, and positive thoughts help vagal tone. Being calm, deep breathing helps vagal tone. Listening to Beethoven and Hockabell and love songs and calming music, that helps vagal tone. Now this, is a, this shows a lot, but it just shows how close the vagus nerve is to all different kinds of nerves. The vagus nerve has connection basically with all the cranial nerves and as well as the blood of vessels and ultimately can affect all of them. This is what a degenerated vagus nerve looks like. This is what a degenerated vagus nerve looks like. This is a normal vagus neuron. This is degenerated vagus neurons. And we want to thank our Turkish colleagues who gave us this slide. So they've done a lot of research which has shown that when the no-dose ganglion specifically the neurons die you get vasospasm in the renal arteries causing kidney disease you get uh, vasospasm into the uh, arteries to the lymph system so you get lymph node necrosis you can have heart attacks the blood supply to the brain can go down just because of degeneration of the no-dose ganglion. So you can get organ failure. You can literally have kidney disease and be on kidney dialysis just because you had a just because you had cervical instability that caused destruction of the cervical spine injuring the vagus nerve. So what you should get from this talk is all this stuff is reversible, but you have to you have to diagnose it correctly. So if you have vagus degeneration, you want to get a digital motion X-ray. If you feel like there's vascular compromise or uh, 
then you have to get a dynamic transcranial Doppler test. And we do other sophisticated autonomic nervous system tests here at Caring Medical Florida. And if we find that you have cervical destructure, you have uh, cervical instability, you have vagus nerve degeneration, all this stuff is reversible for the most part. And the organ injury can stop, the balance can come back, the blood pressure control can come back, the mast cell activation syndrome can reverse, the SIBO can be gone, leaky gut can be gone, and wouldn't you love to be able to eat a piece of bread or have a bowl of ice cream and not feel awful? It's wonderful. <laughs> Okay, so, you know, we measure the vagus nerve, and Ben here, oh, he loves ice cream, so he's laughing. Okay, so we measure, this is the vagus nerve, so we measure the vagus nerve, and oftentimes we find the diameter of the area is, is small compared to normal. When a healthy person has a strong vagus nerve, so when they get under stress, the vagus nerve can then send out impulses to increase blood flow to the organ, then the organ, whether it's the immune system or the digestive tract, then can fight the organism or, or the stress can resolve the stress. When you have poor vagus tone, you just can't handle stress. So whenever there's a stressor or something that potentially can harm the body, a bacteria, a fungus, the coronavirus, um, the uh, job stress, relationship stress, financial stress, toxic diet. The vagus nerve can't do anything about it. It can't do anything about it. So it can't increase uh, blood supply to your liver so your liver can detoxify better. It can send out impulses to your immune system so your immune system can't be activated. So ultimately you end up getting organ disease and potentially getting a fatal disease. So it, it's a very serious problem. Uh, this is the Autobahn. Uh, the vagus nerve is basically the body's Autobahn it can, and it can help us improve blood flow, hormone levels so we can handle life stressors. The vagus nerve and brain function. So when, uh, when, when, when they do vagus nerve stimulation, right, that's one of the things that can help vagus tone is vagus nerve stimulation. So we're one of the clinics in the country that prescribes vagus nerve stimulators. When you stimulate the vagus nerves, the part of the brain that gives joy, that helps the body um, problem solve, that gives high intellect, those parts of the brain improves, like the left frontal cortex, the left prefrontal cortex, the anterior cingulate gyrus. And the parts of the brain that have to do with disease, that have to do with fear, that have to do with pain, like the somatosensory cortex or parts of the amygdala, their blood supply goes down. So in other words, even functional brain MRIs are being correlated with vagus nerve degeneration causing all kinds of problems. So when you improve vagus tone, the primitive parts of the brain go down and the civilized ethical parts of the brain, their blood supply and their function goes up. So in other words, when your vagus tone goes down, uh, you, in other words, the limbic system gets really, really strong and the parts of the brain that problem solve, like the frontal cortex or the anterior cingulate cortex, don't function as well. So that's why you have to improve vagus tone. So you've got a teenager that's making one bad decision after another. They probably are addicted to their cell phones. Their vagus tone is terrible. So what you need to do is they need to improve their cervical curve, get off of the cell phone, and uh, strength, strengthen their posterior cervical muscles. Then you'll see them become calmer, more joyous, and be able to problem solve better. So the vagus nerve has many different effects in the brain, but it basically can help the body overcome fearful or harmful emotions. So if you have trouble handling stress or you have this uncontrollable fear, you have a vagus nerve issue. 
So the vagus nerve, when the vagus nerve is healthy, you feel peaceful, joyful, you have high intelligence, and the body has optimum immune system detoxification blood flow. Like I said, the vagus nerve interacts with the enteric nervous system. When the vagus tone is healthy, the bowel cells there make a lot of serotonin, and serotonin is the happy hormone. If you're on an antidepressant, the antidepressants raise serotonin. Well, the reason why you don't have good serotonin is because you probably have an issue with the vagus nerve input to the bowel. 90% or so, 95% of the serotonin in the body comes from the bowels. So, is there a question? Yes, Dr. Hauser, we have a question from the audience. How does the vagus nerve impact the laryngeal muscles? Okay, just hang on there. I'm going to talk about the larynx. We're going to talk about that in a few minutes. But basically, the vagus nerve it innervates the laryngeal muscles. So if you, you're having, where you're having swallowing difficulty, hoarseness, chronic cough, chronic hiccups, uh, you have difficulty with your vocal cords, that's going to be vagopathy, and you need to get an assessment of why that is. And the follow-up question is also, can it have any influence on the formation of meningiomas? Oh, meningiomas, that's really interesting. Meningioma is a benign tumor. Just know if you have a meningioma, normally you have to get it taken out because the brain, it's taking up space, you know, it's crushing the brain. So it's a benign tumor, but you have to get it out. And if you research, like, tumors and vagus nerve, you'll see that there's a lot of data that part of all these tumors forming is the sympathetic system locally where the tumors forming is too high and vagus nerve input is too low. So let's hear Kim's story and how prolotherapy and, uh, can help even anxiety. Most people don't realize that you can actually have severe anxiety and depression just from instability in the neck. So Kim, why don't you just tell a little bit of what you were feeling and now after two prolotherapy visits, how is the anxiety doing? It's definitely gotten, gotten better. Um, it had gotten to the point where before I came down here for feeling twisted and having a bunch of the issues that I was having, um, I felt just constantly depressed, fighting hopelessness. I would have anxiety. Like if anything went wrong, I have four kids. So if anything changed our schedule or came up with school where I'd have to have things, I would start to feel just super anxious and overwhelmed and like I just couldn't handle it at all. Um, but after two and then having some improvement with my curve, I feel like I can, I can handle so much more. Like I, I don't feel like I am having just like loss of control of my life anymore, you know, like, um, which is crazy cause I am like, I have a good marriage. I have great kids. I, I do love the Lord and I have that, you know, that faith that it's, you know, that kind of holds me steady. But, um, I do. I feel like it's much better. And then if I have a day where things are off, um, I now recognize it for it being my neck. And so I can be like, you know what? I'm really, this is my sympathetic nervous system going crazy right now. Yeah. This is not me having the anxiety attack because I can't handle the stresses of life. And so being able to tell myself that too, I can be like, you know what? This is, I can recognize my sympathetic nervous system mm -hmm. versus what I thought were like constant anxiety, you know, like issues. And so, um, I am, there's just, there's just been that improvement and that contentment with life and being able to kind of roll with the punches again that like I used to be able to do before, yeah. you know, two years ago when everything was, um, and then on your first visit and we'll show the, we'll show it on this video on your first visit, I showed you how deviated your uvula was it's not ever straight right now because we're not there yet, but it will. I will notice when I check it on my good days, it does seem like it's come down a little bit, but then I will have days where something will shift while I sleep or whatever, and I it's like it'll go, you know, like more to the side. It'll, it'll be worse, and then I'll just, you know, a couple of days later, I'll sleep, and things will go back in, and 
you know, I'll notice it coming because I've had days where I'm like, oh, it looks like it's really, you know, starting to come down here. But yeah, so um, that difference is there. The improvement is coming. Um, I'm impatient now because I can see mm -hmm. healing, you know, like. You seem happier, like you seem probably more am, like, my gosh, how, I more like nor normally how we you... We came down here right. when I first started, and all I could do was cry just right. constantly, and I couldn't figure out why. I mean, a lot of this is <laughs> trauma to my body has really, you know, builds up too, but um, I, was, I was. I was fighting so much that I was like, why am I depressed? Why am I anxious? Because I trust the Lord is going to, you know, work this for my good. I've got a good doctor now, like what is what is happening and then you sat down and you're like did you know this can cause anxiety and depression I was like oh my gosh like I'm not going crazy um and so yeah like it it makes a big it makes a big difference it does to even know that you know this is there or to have the days where like I get told I need something for the kids school and I just run on out to the, like I don't feel like oh my gosh like how am I going to go get cookies and xyz and you know that's right. not Right. Yeah, it's not there anymore. Like, it's, uh, it is improving, so. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Wow, what a great story, huh? What a great lady. Uh, this is basically Kim's, you know, before her before. See, this is the normal curve, so this is before and this is after just two prolotherapy sessions. You can see that her spine's getting better. So just know there is such a thing as structural, uh, st structural anxiety. So this is ways that restoring neck stability improves brain function. You, you get an augmentation of vagal tone, and then the parts of the brain that need to be stimulated that has to do with joy, happiness, uh, higher cognitive function, high intellect, problem solving, those parts of the brain increase and the parts of the brain that have to do with primitive things like, uh, oh, I just want, uh, you know, you know, I, I need to overeat or I want, you know, um, I, you know, the destructive behaviors that people do, you know, oh, I got a drink, I got a drink, I got a drink you know, uh, alcohol versus healthy behaviors. Uh, you, you get normalization of intracranial pressure, cerebral spinal food, fluid uh, flows normally, nerve tension on the various brain structures res resolves or gets restored and optimum blood flow. So obviously the, all those things are gonna help brain function. Uh, so I'm, now I'm gonna go to different body parts. So we're just gonna go to the ears. So. Cervical vagopathy or cervical instability can cause radiculopathy, which can give ear pain. Uh, cervical vagopathy can compromise ear blood flow. You get eustachian tube dysfunction and obviously vagal neuropathy. So here's the innervation of the ear. This is C2, C3. The purple here is the vagus nerve. So often when you see vagus nerve stimulation, we're trying to stimulate that part of the ear. And then this is uh, the auricular branch of the vagus nerve. So that's what we're trying to stimulate. And this is the concha or simba concha or the tragus. And then, uh, so these are the two muscles that open the eustachian tube. So the, you, the eustachian tube's main function is to regulate pressure in the inner ear. If this ear feels different pressure than this, your balance is gonna be off you, and you might get, um, you'll get ear fullness um, and you'll feel off balance, you'll get ringing in the ears and you can get vertigo. Now there's two muscles that open up the eustachian tube, the levator villi palatini muscle, which is innervated by the vagus nerve, and the tensor villi palatini muscle, which is innervated by the trigeminal nerve. If those nerves cannot open the eustachian tube, fluid builds up. That's why you get people, some people can say, well, I can't hear as good out of one ear or another ear, or it feels like I have swimmer's ear, or if you're somebody who every morning you gotta go like this to get your eustachian tube to drain or your ear to pop, 
you probably have a vagus nerve issue. And if you've been diagnosed with Meniere's disease, this is the cause of Meniere's disease. Most of the cases is you have inadequate eustachian tube uh, function and you got fullness in your middle ear because of fluid. And if you restore your vagus nerve function, the levator veli palatini muscle opens the eustachian tube and the balance gets better, vertigo gets better, tinnitus ringing in the ear gets better. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think that's, that's everything with that. Um, then see the stapy, stapes muscle, stapes bone, bone here. So you have the malleus inca stapes. The stapes muscle is innervated by the facial nerve. Again, we saw that the vagus nerve interacts with the facial nerve, and the facial nerve also runs by C1, C2. Uh, the, this little muscle, it's like one millimeter or something, or it's just a few millimeters, this muscle. And that's actually what dampens sound. So if you have sound sensitivity, this is the pathophysiology of it. And the cure for sound sensitivity is correction of your curve and res resolution of the instability. So again, this is just a figure showing the fluid in the ear. And fluid in the inner ear, because of cervical instability, and cervical vagopathy because the levator veli palatini muscle doesn't work can cause dizziness, vertigo, lightheadedness, uh, mal de Barkman syndrome where everything seems to be like you're on a boat and you have a woozy feeling. Uh, so some people have clicking in the ear or swishing in the ear. If you've been diagnosed with pulsatile tinnitus, like whoosh, 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 you probably have cervical instability. And we're just gonna show you a, a video on somebody who has, this is one of our patients who has clicking in the ear. And the cause of this is caused by upper cervical instability affecting the vagus trigeminal or facial nerve. And some of the muscles to the inner ear are not working correctly. Caring Medical Florida, we're the clinic of weird symptoms. If you have a weird symptom, you have swishing sound in your ear, you have clicking in your ear, you have a weird neurologic syndrome that nobody can figure out, I'd really recommend that you come in because we specialize in that, if you will. Uh, when you have cervical vagopathy, you have impaired sphincter control between organs. So if you're lower or upper esophageal sphincter isn't working right, you could get reflux, you could get gastroesophageal reflux. If you have decreased stomach acid secretion, you're gonna get poor digestion, bloating, you can't digest your food. Uh, you could get the stomach, it just stops, the food just sits there. Some of our patients are losing so much weight I saw a patient today, when I first saw her, she was losing so much weight. She had lost 15 pounds in the previous like five weeks. And I told her that I can't let her go, even though she lives in Ohio and she had come down here from Ohio to Fort Myers, Florida. And I treated her on a Thursday and I saw her on Monday and she said over the weekend, man, her stomach started to work again. So immediately after prolotherapy, bracing her, getting the tension off of the vagus nerve, her gastroparesis stopped. So if the vagus nerve, so remember I told you that at about 90 minutes, I'm gonna start getting hoarse. So you're seeing cervical vagopathy in action, like you're seeing like my vocal cords, right? <clears throat> so I can talk, I'm good. <laughs> I'm good for about 90 minutes, so bear with me, so thank you. When the vagus nerve input to the bowels isn't good, 
you have slowed bowel transit time, so that's why people get constipated, or they have increased intestinal permeability, leaky gut. You can get pancreas insufficiency, defective body detoxification because the liver doesn't work good, SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, intestinal dysbiosis, and excessive intestinal inflammation. So all that stuff's from vagopathy from the neck. And this just shows that when the vagus nerve is damaged, you get nausea and bloating because the pyloric sphincter doesn't work good. This just shows vagus nerve input to the various organs. So all these organs, spleen, liver, gallbladder, stomach, they're not gonna work good uh, if you have vagopathy. This shows the vagus nerve input to the enteric nervous system in the intestines, in the stomach antral glands, which make the stomach acid. So again, uh, you've probably heard of the enteric nervous system. There's 100 million neurons in the um, intestines and the 100,000 vagal neurons have to, well, it's not even 100,000, it'd be like 50,000, because not all the vagus neurons go there. So you have 50,000 neurons innervating 100 million. So you cannot afford to have even one vagus neuron not working good, because it's gonna affect thousands of enteric neurons. And if you have fibromyalgia, you know, body pain, terrible immune system, fatigue or body aching, or you, you, the doctor has said that your C-reactive protein is high, or your tumor necrosis factor is high, and inflammation is going crazy in your body, you have a vagus nerve problem, and you need to get it evaluated. So the vagus nerve input is necessary for a tight intestinal barrier. So this is Fort Knox, this is what it looks like, the vagus nerve. So if you don't have good vagus function, man, that those tight junctions, Fort Knox, uh, they're gonna loosen up, somebody's gonna rob the gold out of there. And once the tight junctions are like this, it means that anything in your bowels, that means food particles, bacteria, funguses, viruses, those all can get in your bloodstream. And imagine a myriad of things from your bowels permeating your gut associated lymphoid tissue getting into your getting into your bloodstream so right now if you have leaky gut that's what's happening every minute every second of the body so you got to get those tight junctions good and the way to do that is to improve your vagus tone and the way to do that is to correct your neck gut organisms measure 2.2 pounds so if you weigh a I weigh you know, probably 160 pounds, though I should be weighing 150 pounds. Uh, but 2.2 uh, of the pounds that I have is microbiota. And when you have uh, vagopathy, your vagus function is bad, you have craziness going on in your gut flora. It's terrible. Your gut flora, Toxic gut flora flourish, good gut flora go down the tubes. And I'm not saying that diet doesn't play a role. If you want to get healthy, you got to decrease the amount of stressors that you subject yourself to. So obviously, eating organic food, fresh food, eating slowly, chewing your food till it's a liquid, taking your time, stop and smelling the roses, wear a lot of yellow, get funky glasses, uh, surround yourself with positive people, positive thinking. All that stuff improves vagus tone. But I'm just saying there can be a structural reason why your vagus tone is uh, a problem. And if your vagus tone is a problem, you're ultimately gonna have delirious effects on the gut flora and your digestive tract. So if you've been trying to get your digestive tract to work right, and it doesn't, you probably have a vagus nerve problem and need to get it addressed. The vagus nerve, your, if your immune system, you can't get your immune system strong, you're taking echinacea, you're taking licorice root, you're taking all kinds of herbs, you're taking uh, acidophilus, you're on a hypoallergenic diet and your health still is lousy, you, you have impaired vagal cholinergic system. So, 
cervical vagopathy causes immunodysfunction for lots of different reasons. It screws up the vagus inhibitory effects on the sympathetic system. You don't have a normal, uh, your body can't give out cortisol or other anti-inflammatory hormones. Uh, you can't adequately survey bacteria, viruses, coronavirus, other viruses. Uh, you have increased intestinal permeability and your gut immunity is terrible. So this is, this is the cell body of a neuron. You have the axons and the dendrites. So this, I just put this in here. It's just interesting. Like when the animals, when you screw up their vagus nerves, their growth hormone levels go zero. So if your muscle tone isn't good, if you feel like you work out and you have excessive uh, muscle pain after workouts or your exercise tolerance is low, you probably have a vagus nerve issue and probably your growth hormone levels are low. Like I said, vagopathy can cause vasospasms into various arteries and that can even injure other nerves. So they've shown by our Turkish colleagues that when you have no dose ganglion degeneration, the nerves in the neck start to get vaso, the, va the, ner the blood vessels to the nerves of the neck actually go into vasospasm and you can actually have cervical radiculopathy and other nerve injuries in the neck or the cranial nerves from vagus neuropathy. Then the death rates in the animals go crazy, like they go crazy when there's vagopathy and of course you can get the spread and acceleration of cancer and can end up dying from it uh, just because of vagopathy. If, you're, if you have allergies, if you have allergies and nobody can figure out why you have allergies, you probably have vagopathy. When you have vagopathy, your mast cells just go crazy and secrete a whole bunch of histamine and histamine just causes all kinds of problems in the lungs, in the body and causes systemic inflammation. This just shows the vagus nerve uh, connection with a sympathetic neuron. So the vagus nerve is going to inhibit the sympathetic neuron, which again will cause the various immune system cells not to secrete inflammatory cytokines. So if you've had a test and it showed any symptoms of systemic inflammation or your cytokine levels uh, interleukin-6, for instance, is crazy, or your tumor necrosis factor is elevated, you probably have a vagus nerve issue. If you're on a drug like Humira, like Enbrel, or any kind of tumor necrosis factor inhibitor, and you need that for your irritable bowel, for your psoriasis, for your chronic pain, for your autoimmune disease, you have a vagus nerve issue because the, the nerve input that lowers tumor necrosis factor is the vagus nerve. So just by definition, if you, have a, if you need a drug that lowers your tumor necrosis factor, and these are all the diseases where tumor necrosis factors are high, look at them. Multiple sclerosis, sarcoidosis, melanoma, rheumatoid arthritis, eczema, asthma, OCD, polycystic ovarian syndrome, fibromyalgia. So all these diseases could have a vagopathy as the cause or what propagates the disease. Okay, so let's turn our attention to the eyes and vision. If you have macular degeneration, retinopathy, you have glaucoma and they can't figure out why, you have darkening of vision, you have floaters, you have eye pressure, you have darkening of vision, you have blurry vision, you have stuttering vision, where you see something, then you look away and it goes, or it comes into, you have double vision, you have where you see the image, then you look away and the image is still there, you probably have cervical vagopathy. So cervical instability or cervical vagopathy can cause increased intracranial pressure, which, which, which is intracranial hypertension. You can also have increased intraocular pressure, which is called intra, or, or hy, hy, intraocular hypertension. 
You can have optic nerve swelling. We'll show you how we measure that. You can have inadequate pupillary or ocular responses to light. An accommodation is where you're reading something. So I'm reading something, and as you look at it, your, your eye is supposed to accommodate your pupils, and you're supposed to be able to read stuff really close. So if you've noticed that your focusing ability, like at work or on the computer, isn't as good, you probably have a cervical vagopathy causing it, and of course, poor ocular blood flow because the vagus nerve is intricately involved with blood flow to the face, the head, the brain, the eye, the uh, the inner ear by the organ of corti, and, and I've shown you data. It also involves blood flow. It's involved with blood flow to the heart, the lungs, the brain, the kidneys, and other internal organs. So again, the nodose ganglion gets injured at C1. The nodose ganglion inputs, the vagus nerve inputs, inhibit the serp serp superior cervical sympathetic ganglion. When the superior cervical sympathetic ganglion is not inhibited, you're gonna get vasoconstriction of blood vessels to the brain, to the face, and of course that can cause all kinds of things. This kind of shows the vagus nerve uh, input into the superior cervical sympathetic ganglion and ultimately that can cause pupil dilation uh, if this system isn't, uh, it, it, if the interaction isn't uh, responsive or appropriate then what happens is your pupils don't dilate or constrict like they should. So in other words right now I'm looking at a light so my pupils are supposed to be constricted. Well, if the, this system isn't correct, the pupils stay dilated. So if you shine a light in one eye and another eye, and one eye is more dilated than the other eye, then you have a problem in the interaction between the vagus nerve and the superior cervical sympathetic ganglion. The vagus nerve sits at C1, the superior cervical ganglion sits at C2. So again, what would cause that problem is instability at C1, C2. See, this is C1, this is the ganglion of the vagus nerve at C1 and the superior sympathetic ganglion is at C2. So instability in this joint or laxity in the capsular ligaments can cause banging here and banging there, so it's the double duo, right? So negative effects on the eye from vagus nerve degeneration, you get diminished ocular blood flow, exaggerated pupillary hippus, and we'll show you what that is. It means if you notice that your pupils go up, go down, go up, go down, go up and down, uh, or they do that to light, that's most likely a vagus nerve issue. If you have increased intraocular pressure, which of course we know is glaucoma, that can be from uh, cervical instability and vagus nerve issues. Limited pupillary constriction. Again, if the pupil can't constrict, you're gonna have sensitivity to light. Uh, vagus nerve degeneration can ultimately lead to optic nerve damage and poor image quality. So can we show this one? And I guess you'll. Do we need some? Mm -hmm. So here we're going to show pupillary hippus. So see, watch how the pupil it, it it pulsates. It's pulsating. Boom, 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 boom. It's see how it goes down and up and down and up. With a light, with light, the pupil is supposed to constrict, and this side doesn't do it as much. So this person has more. Uh, pupillary hippus on the left side than the right side and the cause of that is cervical instability and the cervical instability affects the vagus nerve right look at that look at how dilated that pupil is to light like light your pupils are supposed to in deep your pupils are supposed to constrict so that so much light doesn't go in we actually do a sophisticated measurement of pupillary constriction so we objectify it, and once we resolve this, the instability and cervical vagopathy with prolotherapy, then the pupillary constriction gets back to normal. So this is a person with a normal optic nerve on one side. Uh, this is a swollen optic nerve on the other side. 
So this was the eye that the person had more blurriness of vision to. Remember I said that cervical instability can obstruct cerebral spinal fluid flow. So it's like a clogged up toilet on one side. So if you have on the right side that the instability is obstructing the uh, toilet from flushing on this side, you're going to get swelling of brain structures on this side, including the optic nerve. Normal optic nerve diameter is less than five. So we can measure this with high resolution ultrasound and this will improve as the stability in the neck improves with prolotherapy and as vagal tone improves and the neck architecture improves. So our, the one person had asked questions about the vagus nerve input to the vocal cords. So you can end up with uh, aspiration of saliva or food particles into the lungs because of cervical vagopathy affecting the larynx and pharynx. It affects the vocal cords. The palate doesn't elevate because of the levator veli palatini muscle isn't working correctly. Uh, so if you look at your uvula and it deviates to one side, that's diagnostic of vagus nerve, uh, basically paralysis or neuropathy on one side. Uh, you get irritated throat sensors. So if your vagus nerve isn't working correctly, your respiratory tract, your larynx, your pharynx can be hypersensitive. So that can lead to what? Chronic hiccups, chronic cough. If you're always clearing your throat, you probably have a vagus nerve issue. And when your esophageal sphincters don't work right, you continually get acid reflux. reflux. So acid reflux can be caused by vagopathy and this just shows how many vagus neurons there are, you know, how many vagus neurons. If you see, there's about 80,000 to 100,000 uh, neurons in the vagus nerves in the mid cervical region, but the branch, the recurrent laryngeal nerve, there's only 8,000. The recurrent laryngeal nerve, that's what innervates the vocal cords. So imagine you only have 8,000 neurons, so uh, if you have cervical instability that's affecting the recurrent laryngeal nerve, your vocal cords on one side aren't going to work, so you're going to get a raspy voice, or you can't sing, or you, or you can't hit the high notes, or, or your swallowing is affected. So this just shows the nodose ganglion and the various musculature. Uh, the thyroid cartilage is around C4. So the recurrent laryngeal nerve can be affected not just by upper cervical instability, but mid cervical instability. And this, the most common instabilities we find on digital motion x-ray is at C1, C2 affecting the nodose ganglion and at C4, C5, which absolutely can affect the superior laryngeal nerve and recurrent laryngeal nerve. And that can affect uh, the uh, muscles in the pharynx and larynx so the person can feel like they can't swallow normally or have difficulty swallowing. And again, this just shows swallowing and the vagus nerve is involved in all of this, the upper esophageal sphincter, lower esophageal sphincter, the epiglottis, the palate eleva elevating, all this involves the vagus nerve and it can get screwed up in any portion of it when you have cervical vagopathy. When you have cervical vagopathy affecting the vocal cords, you get paralysis. The, the, with talking, the vocal cords can't close. So you, you just end up with poor airway exchange. You feel like you're short of breath, so you have no reason. Like you get a, you go to a pulmonologist and they can't figure out why you're short of breath. Why you, yeah, why you, you, you know, your oxygen isn't good. Uh, it can be because the vocal cords aren't allowing the air to go down. These, remember I said heart rate variability, so you can measure heart rate variability by various monitors. So you just go on the internet, type in heart rate variability monitor. You download an app and you can, you can measure that uh, every day. Look at all these diseases that are associated with low heart rate variability. So when your vagal tone is low, your heart rate variability is low, meaning that your beat-to-beat -beat variability, so you know how the EKG is 
boom, 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 boom. When you're relaxed and you deep breathe and your heart rate slows, then it speeds up, slow speeds up because you're uh, relaxed. When you're stressed out, it's boom, 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 and there's no variability between heartbeats. So the way you monitor vagal tone at home is with heart rate variability, and almost every disease is associated with low vagal tone. So if you want to improve your vagal tone just by lifestyle changes like getting rid of stressors, proper thinking, having a strong faith in God, exercising, every time you are petting your cat or your dog, you're touching the hand of a loved one, you're laughing, you're drinking wine, just a little bit of wine, then uh, uh, you're smelling lavender, uh, you're reading a good book, you're not watching the news, uh, you're not worrying, you're having positive thoughts, you have gratefulness. Gr gratefulness, if you think about it, gratefulness means that what you have is enough. Ungrateful means that what you have isn't enough. Like I've seen some really sick people who have gratitude. Like you, you know, like they, they're just amazing. So you can you can be joyful and peaceful even with a chronic terrible ailment. So you guys watching this means that you haven't given up yet. So just know you're being brave and courageous. And if anything I've said rings true to you or somebody you love, please, please. Get an assessment, get a digital motion x-ray, see if there's a structural cause of the vagopathy, and then ultimately, uh, if you need to, get prolotherapy here. Yeah. yeah. We have a question about vision. Vision. Does this cause the sunspots that take a long time to go away when you come inside from outside? Oh, sunspots, yeah. Uh, no, the, you know, suns, you know, sunspots off, you're talking about when you're looking at the sun? It's blood vessels, I think. Okay, yeah. No, I think that's a, that's actually uh, that's actually a separate issue, but that's that's a good question. Uh, 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 so when you have a negative emotion, your heart rate variability goes down. When you have a positive emotion, like I'm grateful to be with Ben and Izzy, they're great co-workers. We have a lot of fun together. Uh, and Ben corrected me; he actually likes bread better than ice cream, so I apologize, <laughs> Brent. No, or even if I offended Brent, Ben right away, I just asked forgiveness because I did one time get upset with him for no really good reason, and I asked you for no, I did remember. I asked you for forgiveness, like unforgiveness and bitterness. It just it's a negative emotion, so it's gonna it's gonna stress a person out, decreases vagal tone, resonance resonance breathing is interesting. When you breathe six times a minute, that improves vagus function the most as far as breathing. Most of us breathe like, you know, 10 to 15 times a minute. So it's best to, for all of us to really be slowing our breathing down, and that's going to improve heart rate variability the most. We're going to talk a little bit about vagus nerve stimulation, but in two months, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go further into vagus nerve and what you can do about it. And I will at that talk, so if we could take notes, or I am going to talk about vagus nerve issues in kids. So we're definitely going to go through that. And some of the topics like uh, the vagus nerve affecting the endocrine system, we didn't have, a, we didn't have time to do that one. And we'll, we'll talk more about vagus nerve stimulation, and I will talk more on heart rate variability and how you can use that to improve your health. But the first vagus nerve stimulator, so that's just a device that the surgeon implanted to stimulate the vagus nerve was 2005, and they showed that uh, chronic depression could help be helped a lot, chronic epilepsy or really severe epilepsy and depression the first FDA-approved device in the United States was Gamma in 2017. But just know there's lots of the vagus nerve stimulators you can use at home, so you don't need a prescription for it. And, you know, there's different ways to put it on. This is an earbud thing. And look at all the ways that vagus nerve stimulation helps. Angina is lesson. It helps uh, decrease inflammation. It decreases heart. Uh, heart rate and blood pressure, so it improves quality of life, improves uh, rheumatoid arthritis, blood work. 
So we're one of the centers where we teach people about vagus nerve stimulators and uh, have some patients on vagus nerve stimulators. But ultimately what a person needs is their own vagus nerve to be stimulated by peaceful living, positive li living, and improvement of vagus tone by uh, improvement in their neck curvature and neck stability. Yes. An audience okay. member would like to know your opinion on vagus nerve stimulation in regard to cervical instability and if people need that in addition to prolotherapy. Oh, the, the question is just, do you need vagus nerve stimulation in, uh, in, a, yeah, in addition to prolotherapy? And I'll even answer it, could you do it just by itself? So, you know, you know like some people are going to come and they have issues, but they actually don't have cervical instability by the digital motion x-ray. So some of those people, I'll just give various weights. I'll have them wear different weights to correct the curve. And if their vagus nerve function is poor, they could just do vagus nerve stimulation with a vagus nerve stimulator and all the things we talked about, like essential oils and living a positive, healthy lifestyle. Then, And then, obviously, if somebody has severe uh, vagopathy and they're slow to respond to prolotherapy and curve correction, then you might then early on start them on a vagus nerve stimulator. But the patients who come to Caring Medical, they want to get cured of their problem. I know I'm not supposed to use the word cure, so I'm going to say that we greatly help uh, people uh, resolve their their condition. Like obviously a person who has dizziness, if you diagnose the problem correctly, like let's say a person has the blood supply, like let's just for argument's sake say it's the blood supply in the vertebral artery and they extend and they turn their head to the left and the, the blood supply of the vertebral artery goes away and the cause of it is C1, C2 instability, after prolotherapy, that condition should be resolved. You know, So vagus nerve stimulation is a good treatment option, but it's still not correcting why the vagus nerve is degenerated. And, the, and you, obviously, let's try to regenerate the vagus nerves and correct the underlying problem. So this is one of our great patients, Paulina. She's an awesome lady. She exercises a lot. So in the course of her care, we said to her, what do you do for a living? So I work on a computer a lot. How, how do you have the computer? And we just made sure that she was looking up. So we made sure she was looking up. And she's on like a balance board here. And see how she's in her bare feet. So she's actually getting a workout while she's working, right? So. Ways to improve vagus function is make sure that you're looking up, you know, to correct your curve, decrease your stress, prolotherapy to resolve cervical instability. So, you know, up, a good upper cervical orthospinology, chiropractor orthospinology, Alice Orthogonal, Nuka. Some of those doctors, they're just, they're just amazing. They really are amazing. So. If you can't right away get to a prolotherapist, consider upper cervical chiropractor, but it has to be somebody who's specialized in that. They'll take x-rays and they'll tell you which way your C1 is tilted and if you don't hold the adjustment, then get prolotherapy. When we talked about vagus nerve stimulation. Thank you so much. So on Tuesday, May 5th, I'm gonna do part three of the vagus nerve webinars. If you didn't see part one, I'd really encourage you to see part one. Uh, so, uh, obviously, I'll continue in the neurology of cervical instability. We do, we will emphasize uh, the kids. We'll talk about, um, we'll talk about uh, the endocrinopathy, how cervical, how vagopathy causes endocrinopathy. Uh, and anybody who has questions, you know, if you want me to cover something in the next uh, webinar, please just. Uh, email me at drhauser at caringmedical.com and I thank you for your attention and always if you have any questions about anything I covered please go to drhauser at caringmedical.com on our website you can download one of our books so I, Mary and I wrote a book called Curing Chronic Pain with Prolotherapy 
I really recommend that you read that because there's a lot of information on how prolotherapy can resolve joint instability in all the parts of the body. And again, feel free to contact us, contact me at drhauser at caringmedical.com. Have a great rest of the day.